Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Stench of Truth here on Blog Talk Radio. Um, tonight I have a special show, a Sunday night show, uh, for my guest, Nick Redfern. I'm sure most of, not all of, my listeners will know who Nick Redfern is, but I wanted to read a little bio from ufomystic.com on Nick Redfern as a sort of introduction. So here goes. Nick Redfern started his writing career as an 18-year-old in 1982 on a British-based music, fashion, and entertainment magazine called Zero. His interest in UFOs was prompted by his father, who worked on radar with the British Royal Air Force, and who was personally aware of several UFO encounters investigated by the British government in the 1950s. Having been assured by sinister government stooges that UFOs were a crock and nothing more than misidentifications, hoaxes, lies, and the deranged tales of certifiably whacked-out nutjobs, Nick, a cynical soul and never one to believe in anything told to him by the official world, decided to head off in hot pursuit of the truth about UFOs for himself, and he's still looking. Nick began his quote-unquote career in ufology as a firm devotee of the works of Kehoe, Stringfield, and a multitude of other long-gone high-profile figures who believed that E.T. was visiting the Earth. Today, Nick believes that the answers to the UFO mystery can probably be found somewhere within a combination of the collective works of Greg Bishop, John Keel, Terence McKenna, Rick Strassman, Alester Crowley, and Jack Parsons. Nick is the author of eight books, well, more than that now, on unsolved mysteries and UFOs, A Covert Agenda, The FBI Files, Cosmic Crashes, Strange Secrets with Andy Roberts, Three Men Seeking Monsters, Body Snatchers in the Desert, On the Trail of the Saucer Spies, and Celebrity Secrets. He has written for UFO Magazine, Fortean Times, Fate Magazine, and the British Daily Express newspaper. Nick has spent weeks chasing the vampire-like chupacabras in Puerto Rico for the Sci-Fi Channel and Canada's Space Channel, roamed around the old base at Roswell, New Mexico in search of decaying, smelly alien corpses, tried to conjure up pulpa-style thought forms of Bigfoot, lycanthropes, and lake monsters in his home country of England, and was once less than politely turned away from the fringes of Area 51, Nevada, by a fat and humorless security guard. Nick lives with his wife Dana in almost spitting distance of the infamous grassy knoll, and his favorite things, quote-unquote, include punk rock music, ultra-violent zombie movies, chocolate, Carlsberg special brew beer, and the books of Jack Kerouac and Werewolves. Well, uh, as I noted in that little reading from UFO Mystic, uh, of course, Nick has written many more books, uh, in addition to the ones that are talked about there, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a a little bit about each of those, but I'm not going to waste any more time. Nick is on the line, and I'm going to bring him on the air right now. So here goes. Hey, Nick, are you there? Hey Teddy, I am. How's it going? All right. So so glad to have you on the show. Oh, sure, I'm glad to be on. Thanks. Yes, and um, as I as I noted uh, in my description for you on the show, and also in the introduction there that I read from uh, UFO Mystic, a note about your writing and the prolific nature of it which I'm very grateful for because I'm always looking for things to read. And it seems like my authors that I really like, such as yourself, <laughs> can never keep up with my with my reading. So uh, I'm really glad that you keep putting this stuff out. And uh, uh, let's, um, let's start off, if we can, if you could tell us uh, about uh, the latest work that you have put out. Would that be the NASA Conspiracies? Yeah, that's the most recent book, which came out about two months ago. And basically, it's a study of 
the way in which NASA has had involvement in primarily UFO-related issues, everything from UFO sightings reported by astronauts, um, the so-called face on Mars controversy, um, NASA documents on what would happen in a theoretical situation if we ever encountered alien life, um, even reports of NASA having involvement in several alleged UFO crash stories. So, so it pretty much covers the whole range, I guess, of UFO-related issues as they concern NASA, but also delves into such other NASA conspiracy theories, you know, things like did we go to the moon or not. So it sort of, sort of broadly covers all the different theories and controversies that have been leveled at NASA. And uh, I think that's a, a very pertinent topic because uh, a lot of times, especially when it comes to like the moon landing hoax, uh, there's a lot of, um, I don't know what you would call it, I guess there, there's there, there's a lot of controversy around it because some very prominent people uh, have have attempted to be whistleblowers on that particular um, on that particular thing. And it wouldn't surprise me in the least, especially when it comes to UFOs, that NASA would be uh, the place to look for for uh, any alien encounters that uh, the U.S. government would be involved in. I would I would be sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's obviously, you know, if for example, some UFOs are alien spacecraft and they're coming from point A to point B, then I think anything that's, I guess, out there you know, is going to have a bearing on the people who are looking at what's out there, and that predominantly is NASA, you know. And uh, and we know this from the fact that at the turn of the 1960s, NASA actually contracted with the Brookings Institute to produce a report that actually looked at kind of like a long-range forecast-type report for NASA on, you know, what NASA could expect to encounter, not, not necessarily just in outer space, but, you know, the, how the agency, recommendations for how the agency should progress and the sort of work it should get involved in. And one of the sections of the report, um, bearing in mind this was sort of just after NASA was formed, was relative to, well, what happens if we go looking in outer space for, for life and we find evidence of it. Um, one of the intriguing aspects of the report, one of the recommendations, was not when the general public should be told if alien life has been discovered, but if the general public should be told. And, you know, I think this report, which was a very significant Brookings report, where more than 200 people in various scientific areas were interviewed, um, I think it sort of laid down the foundations for much of the NASA's attitude, if you like, to the UFO phenomenon in terms of playing it down and not wanting to draw too much attention to it if, you know, they were following these recommendations about how we inform the general public of what's going on or we don't inform them. Yes, and, and of course, anybody who, is, who has investigated uh, government um, actions and, if you want to say, conspiracies, the Brookings Report is a very infamous one because uh, yeah. a lot of UFO researchers point back to that as being a sort of, a sort of proof that the government would necessarily cover up um, information that would lead to evidence coming out of ETs on other planets or, or what have you. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. One of the most, or the, one of the areas that's sort of glossed over, a lot of people forget about it or just plain don't realize, is that the Brookings Report talks about how if we ventured into space and started exploring the nearby planets, we might find ancient, <coughs> excuse me, ancient artifacts on some of the nearby worlds. Now, of course, today, that sort of ties in very well with the whole face on Mars controversy, which some people, a lot of people do believe, you know, is some sort of ancient artifact of a long extinct race. So it's kind of intriguing that the report almost, I guess, uh, predicted, you know, the sort of things and the controversies that we're now actually getting into, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. Yeah, it is actually, now that you put it that way, with the idea of finding artifacts. Um, well, of course, uh, you know Richard Hoagland has um, done a lot of work on yeah. on the Mars face and the the pyramidal structures, and also with uh, some some work uh, looking at possible structures on the Moon as well. Mm -hmm. And um, well, my you know my particular take on on UFOs is probably closer to yours than than it would be to you know the more nuts and bolts. Uh, people because i think that you have a broader view of of ufo's and aliens than just the 
just uh, craft coming from other planets somewhere else in our universe to visit us here. Um, so I'm I'm kind of skeptical when it comes to um, you know actually aliens and ETs, physical bodies and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. You know which you know you've covered in a couple of your other books like uh, yeah. Body Snatchers in the Desert and and uh, which I really like that book in particular because it it kind of um, it kind of uh, it sort of backed up an idea that I had uh, about the Roswell event and it probably wasn't original with me but it was just something that I came up with as a a way to explain uh, what was going on there and uh, some of of what you put forward in that book was it, 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 it confirmed in my mind that I was looking in the right direction you know what I mean? Yeah I know what you mean, I mean I think you know when you talk about the whole ET, body angle, nuts and bolts, craft. You know, I mean, as you pointed out in my introduction, that was how I came to view the subject when I was a kid and first got into it. And I think a lot of people did. But then the further I got into it, I found that the really weird reports were really weird. And some of the other unexplained reports seemed to fall into the category of advanced military craft. And I think today my view is that what we're, what we're seeing are two genuine phenomena. One which is made up of highly advanced military vehicles that the government, I'm sure, are quite happy to have people think are UFOs because it acts as a good cover for their you know, new craft that are being test flown, etc. But I do believe there is an absolutely genuine unknown UFO phenomenon. But I'm not today, and haven't been for sort of 10 years or more, convinced that it's literally extraterrestrial. I think we could be looking at something that encompasses everything from sort of the interdimensional issues that are now being explained by things like quantum physics, Um, possibly even things like tulpas, like constructed thought forms, um, and just entities that we don't really understand even what they are, but that even seem to masquerade and sort of subvert their actual origins and and intent. And I think, you know, the, the whole extraterrestrial angle is or the belief system, if you like, is almost like a modern-day equivalent of belief in goblins, fairies, and demons. That At the heart of all these mysteries, there's something which has manipulated mankind for thousands of years, and it's presented itself in different guises. And the the ET motif, if you like, is the latest one. But what the real phenomenon is and what it wants, that's the big question. But but there is a phenomenon. Absolutely, and I I agree with you completely. I think you covered a, a broad a broad range of uh, particular ideas there that 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 have a resonance with me, and I think they have a resonance with a lot of people today who are trying to look at the bigger picture behind it, rather than just looking at it. Uh, like for instance, um, I I look at um, the uh, disclosure project, and mm-hmm. and I see that. It, it it comes off to me, and and if uh, maybe maybe you want to comment on it or not, I don't I don't know. But but my particular take on it is it's sort of like they're they're approaching this from the point of view that the that the governments are hiding information, which I have no doubt that there is some. But but it's almost as if there it's a foregone conclusion that there are answers in there. You know what I mean? That they're that that it's just getting people up to the point where, where oh, if they just release these files, we'll mm-hmm. finally have an answer to what UFOs are, and it, mm-hmm. it leans towards the idea of you know mechanical craft mm-hmm. coming from another planet, and and I think that's too limiting in 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 a way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Oh no, you, you're quite right. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that you know the the, the premise of disclosure I, I think is a great one. The idea of having people in positions of influence and people with credible backgrounds telling their stories about UFOs and then, you know, the group itself or the the body of people lobbies the government to say, tell us what you know. But you're quite right that it is actually taken from the perspective that what is being hidden is nuts and bolts craft and the government is back engineering them, um, etc., etc. Now, maybe that's true, but my view is that we don't, you know, when the U in UFO still stands for unidentified, the extraterrestrial hypothesis and the idea that the government has secret hangars with alien bodies in is a belief system based around 
the available evidence we have right now. You know, there are just as many UFO reports that come across as very, almost like definitively paranormal, as there are ones that come across nuts and bolts-like. But this, the Disclosure Project and similar projects very, very rarely, if ever, deal with the truly high strangeness cases where you have crossovers with other paranormal phenomena. Um, you know, it is very much just down the idea of advanced mechanical ships from some scientific, you know, civilization visiting us, and that's what's being hidden. Now, you know, the, the problem is that I know for many people who follow the whole disclosure angle, they won't be satisfied until the government confirms that angle. You know, if the government says, well, we've looked into it, but it's totally paranormal, it's not extraterrestrial, that simply will not satisfy a lot of the people who do follow the sort of disclosure approach. And I know that through speaking to them, you know, because they are primed for the, the ETH angle. Yeah, because it's it's almost like a dogma for some people, some investigators and people who are who you know are armchair investigators themselves. It's kind of a, an accepted reality already, and uh, exactly as you say, they will not be satisfied uh, no matter what the government releases unless it confirms that mm-hmm. you know nuts and bolts craft are coming here with aliens from another planet. Yeah, um, my view has always been that. You know, there's, there's a genuine unknown UFO phenomenon, which is not, which is nothing to do, you know, with uh, with us. It is genuinely unknown. But trying to label it is, a, you know, the biggest mistake you can do. You know, it's like we should be open to all the various theories and investigate them, but don't champion one over the other when we have no proof that that one is is worth championing over than over all the others. But. Exactly, and I, you know, I, I think when you you were you were talking a little bit earlier about uh, fairies and elves and and things like that, and and um, when you when you look at the, the things that are, are seen in a cultural perspective, I think you must have hit upon this at some point in in, in your writing that um, uh, a lot of times UFOs sort of um, the the whatever the phenomenon is, it, it sort of uh, corresponds to cultural memes that are present mm-hmm. at the time. And uh, I think when we came into an age of high technology, we we ha- we see things that look like mechanical ships sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe like you say there may be there may be entities or a force or whatever you want to call it behind this that that may in fact be trying to disguise itself. And uh mm-hmm. that kind of that kind of leads into your um the book that came out before this one on uh final the final uh final events uh mm-hmm. where you talked about the uh the um think tank the Collins mm-hmm. elite yeah. that um that uh came to the came to a particularly interesting conclusion do you want to talk about that for a for a yeah, moment sure. or two yeah i mean final events is probably next to body snatchers the most controversial book i've written you know body snatchers kind of for many in the UFO community, kind of people were classing me almost as like a cross between Osama bin Laden and Adolf Hitler. For daring <laughs> to say that, you know, for daring to say that maybe aliens didn't actually crash at Roswell. It's like, how dare you say that? Do you know what I mean? Oh, for goodness sake, um, yes. <laughs> and and it was kind of it was kind of similar with final events, but from the perspective that a lot of people who read it didn't like it because they did, it disturbed them and they didn't. I know through speakers, and they didn't want it to be true. They hoped it wouldn't be true because it was such a sort of terrifying scenario to them. So, you know, they dismissed it in the sense that body snatchers they dismissed because they didn't want the Roswell apple cart upset, if you like. Final mm-hmm. events were sort of dismissed by a lot of people because they couldn't face the possibility it was real. Now, my view is that, you know, I think, as I said, I think the, the truth behind the UFO phenomenon is probably going to be more something along the lines of interdimensional rather than literal extraterrestrial. Now, you can actually tie that in with the final events book. For those who haven't read the book, it's basically a study of a think tank group in the deep within the Pentagon called the Collins Elite that investigated UFOs for many years and came to the conclusion that the whole phenomenon was literally, and I do mean literally, demonic. You know, the idea that these entities are sort of the minions of Satan masquerading as aliens to try and, you know, instigate the final battle between good and evil and the enslavement of our souls. You know, that that is literally the scenario this group came up with. Now, 
as I've pointed out in all the interviews I did for the book, and actually in the book, you know, my view is that I'm open-minded on scenarios. Um, but, you know, if you ask me, do I think this scenario is correct, I have to say that I think, like with the UFO phenomenon, excuse me, the UFO community, a lot of the conclusions were driven by the preconceived belief systems of the group, many of whom were ardent Christians. And so, you know, they put that sort of spin, consciously or not, on their conclusions. Um, but what I do think, where I do agree with them completely, is that the phenomenon, as you pointed out, seems to masquerade as extraterrestrial. It's constantly changing to suit the culture of the times. And, and it masquerades as whatever's in vogue, if you like, for the people of that era. And it may actually not be friendly. Um, there seems to be a high degree of manipulation and subversion and deceit at work. Now, you know, it's entirely possible that if you go back thousands of years and you look at how ancient man, you know, seemed to have a deeper knowledge of certain spiritual issues than we do today. And I think there's an argument to be said for the, the idea that maybe the, uh, the old stories of places like heaven and hell and things like that, in my view, maybe ancient man having some knowledge of higher or extra dimensions, other realms, but they put a spin on it that was, if you like, demonic or angelic. Today, it's looked as, as scientific, the idea of other realms of existence. And I think that's what we could be looking at with the Collins elite's conclusions, that they are potentially right in the sense they're looking at entities that aren't extraterrestrial, that come from other realms. But I don't believe, as they did, that you know we're talking about a literal fiery pit if you like I, I you know to me that's too simplistic of a scenario and it, you know and if that upsets people well you know that's that's just how it goes i mean you know i point out I, i'm not a particularly religious person so it's ironic i wrote the book but i didn't write the book to say hey you know the ufos are demonic the book was written to say hey there is a group in the government that believes ufos are demonic and it's a fascinating story and here it is you know, I tried to sort of leave my views out because, you know, it's there's nothing worse than having some lofty, self-appointed UFO author saying, I'm right, etc., etc. All you can really do until we know is put the information out for people and, you know, throw it all against the wall and see what sticks. Um, and some of it does and some of it doesn't. And that's, you know, but all, if we don't share it and put it all out there, we're never going to get the answers. So that's what I, you know, I tried to do with final events, if you like. Well, I well, I have a lot of respect for you for doing that because you realize, of course, and you you said so yourself that that when you put out these controversial things that that question you know accepted dogma within the field, that you're setting yourself up to be you know to be ridiculed by certain groups or people. Well, it wasn't. And, it wasn't so much, I didn't so much get ridiculed, but it was more people just vehemently disagreed. But you know, again, they're disagreeing with a scenario because they're upholding a scenario which they can't prove is true. You know, it's like exactly. it's a belief they have. It's a belief, you know. It's, if somebody can provide me with a piece of undeniable wreckage from a UFO or a bit of alien DNA, then, you know, the whole matter's closed. But when we have, like, UFO reports that are associated with, for example, poltergeist activity and synchronicities, you know, how do you explain that in just the idea of, alien scientists visiting the earth you know there's there is a, a paranormal element or overtones you know to the to the phenomenon there's no doubt about that yeah absolutely um i couldn't agree with you more and i and i think that that more people need to take a, a broader approach like you do and say when i come across information that points out a particular angle to something to put it out there because you know that that could be part of the answer to what's going on rather than just approaching it from the point of view that well these this is one particular phenomenon whatever particular angle you take on it and and just try to you know pursue that in every way that you can rather than looking at all the other possibilities that are out there you know um i had i had paul eno on um i don't know if you're familiar with him i think you were on his show right behind the paranormal yeah, yeah, yeah. i had him on uh, on friday and he actually oh, cool. mentioned the Mothman prof or the Mothman events down in um, mm -hmm. in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and and he said that um, and he, he brought up a very good point. He said that this that it wasn't just the the Mothman and injured cold 
going on down there that when you mm-hmm. actually looked at it and, and and saw all of the other things that were involved mm-hmm. in it, just like John Keel himself, when he went down to investigate, he found that there were UFOs and all of these other strange and weird and bizarre events going on associated with that. And, uh, you know, just having the UFOs tied in with that, you know, leads one to believe that that um, that all of these things are connected in some way. Oh, yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that at all. I mean, you can find throughout ufological history, you know, there are certain cases and events that where UFOs are an integral part of the story, but they're only a small part. I mean, there's a very good book that's recently come out by a friend of mine, <clears throat> named Stan Gordon, it's called Silent Invasion, and he deals with a wave of encounters in uh, 72 to 74 in, seven, in Pennsylvania, where there were a whole range of UFO and Bigfoot reports, and which also encompass things like um, prophecies and, pose- and like almost like psychic possession, and they were all tied in together. You know, it was, it was almost like a 1970s equivalent of the Mothman prophecies. And, you know, you find similar things... Uh, around the world, originally from where I'm, where I'm from in England, I used to live near a large area of forest called the Cannock Chase, and that's sort of renowned for sightings of UFOs, black, big black cats and giant black dogs with glowing eyes, Bigfoot type creatures, werewolves, ghosts, all in this one area of forest. So you know, it's quite clear that there are parallels and tie-ins with all these phenomena. The the big question is that we still don't have the answer to is why and how can a creature like Mothman appear where purported UFOs are also appearing? You know, it's too simplistic to say, you know, Mothman is like some pet of the aliens or whatever. You know, that that just doesn't hold water. It's There's something stranger going on, almost as if, you know, this phenomenon, as you said, is, is masquerading and, and almost like toying with people, like deliberately appearing for the to be seen. It's almost like it needs to be seen in some respects. Yeah, I I think that's uh, I think that's a good way to put it. Um it it does seem as though a lot of times especially when you look at particular cases it it seems like what is being done is almost scripted in some fashion yeah. to give a particular impression. And um I I mean this goes even into, you know, some some other more far out ideas like, you know, military abductions being disguised mm-hmm. as as UFO abductions or mm-hmm. vice versa even, you know, mm-hmm. as far as people who claim to have been abducted. I mean, that's mm-hmm. something that's out there as well. And uh, it, it, the fact that all of these different phenomena are connected in some way, or at least they manifest themselves in relation to one another, which you, could lead you to the con- con- conclusion, uh, I think rightly, that that it's a phenomenon that's broader and it, it manifests itself in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you were talking about the Collins elite, I... I, I remember you saying, um, I think I, I was listening to an interview that you, you did with someone else, and I can't remember the show right now, forgive me, but um, you were talking about, because um, uh, I have the book, I, I just haven't finished it yet, mm-hmm. um, but you were talking about uh, how when you were talking to some of the people who were in the group that mm-hmm. uh, they commented to you that they kept running into other people who seemed to be doing the same thing and it might have been another group that was in the government or uh, yeah. can you can you uh can you elaborate on that a little bit yeah sure well what got me into this story was i interviewed about four years ago a man named ray boucher ray lives in nebraska and he's a former state director for the for MUF on the mutual ufo network and in ni- late 1991, he met a couple of guys who were working on a project in the Department of Defense to contact what they referred to as non-human entities, or NHEs. And the, the gr- essentially, the group was almost like some sort of deep cover secret group investigating UFOs. But the more they dug into it, the more the group concluded that, yes, there's a genuine UFO phenomenon, but no, it's not extraterrestrial. And they came to conclude that the group, that, excuse me, these NHEs were sort of deceptive, literal demonic creatures. But there were people in the group who had this sort of idea of almost bargaining, having like some sort of Faustian pact with these entities to try and understand the powers they had over the human race. And could we then exploit them and use them on our, you know, 
potentially hostile nations on earth you know it's sort of like doing a deal with the devil to understand his powers and then use them against other human beings now race people were, were clearly working in the same fields as the Collins elite but the Collins elites were sort of deathly afraid of the whole UFO phenomenon and, and were trying to find ways to prevent it getting its grips into the human race whereas the people that race boat with their group was trying to do a deal in simple terms, you know, to understand mm. the, the technologies. And a lot of people don't realize this is that, you know, within government, everybody thinks the government's like a unified body. And this goes for governments all around the world, you know, but it actually isn't. You know, you have groups within groups that get black budget funding and that don't even officially exist sometimes. You know, everybody knows about agencies like the CIA, the FBI, National Security Agency, but very often... You know, there are groups within groups that get, um, you know, as I said, black budget, budget funding that aren't um, responsible or, you know, to congressional oversight or anything like that. And so they go under the radar and people don't even know they exist because the money's being channeled under cover of other projects, you know, and the, the government itself as a unified entity may, and even the president may not even know these groups, you know, are, are in formation. Um, but that's at least two groups that we know were involved in these sort of areas. And there's, there's a very famous case from 1973 um, involving a uh, helicopter crew that was flying over Ohio, and they had this encounter uh, with a UFO. And the, the pilot of the aircraft, he was a Captain Coyne, and he and one of the, his colleagues reported how after this encounter they would get calls from the Pentagon asking if they'd had any strange dreams that actually covered some of the areas that the Collins elite were digging into. For example, they were asked, have you ever felt, had dreams about dying and being raised out of your body and seeing your body? Have you had near-death experiences, things like that? Now, from the people I spoke to, it seems that the Collins elite weren't the people asking Captain Coyne and his crew. And, they ver and Captain Coyne verified these calls came from the Pentagon. You know, but it wasn't the Collins elite, according to the Collins elite. And it doesn't seem to have been Ray Boucher's people because they weren't around in the early 70s. This group apparently didn't form until the 80s. So this is possibly a third group in government that was looking at the paranormal aspects of the UFO phenomenon and sort of quietly digging around and, and asking questions. So I think there's probably either it was three different groups or possibly splinters of the same group who were all divided on on which way the research should go if you like. Hmm. Did you find did you find any evidence to to indicate that um any of these groups are still continuing today? Um well that's actually a very good question. I mean the Collins elite their their work today as I point out you haven't probably seen this yet because you haven't got to the very end of the book but their work seems to be almost on hold because they feel that they've actually proven what's going on. And now it's just a case of trying to find a way to sort of cut the the demons off at the pass, if you like, to prevent them getting their grips into us. And, you know, they, they believe in the literal prophecies of the Antichrist will return and there'll be the final battle. But they believe that the Antichrist will return in the guise of aliens. And when the world's in crisis, we'll embrace the aliens and, you know, say, yeah, we want you just to take control of the planet because everything's out of control. And that's when Satan, if you like, will get his grips into the human race. That's how that, that's how they view it. And so they feel there's no need to investigate it anymore. It's a matter of just trying to find a way to prevent that prophecy from, from coming true. Um, there are other groups, apparently, that still are going, and they're the ones who want to try and almost bargain, if you like, you know, do a deal with the devil. Um and, you know, it sounds bizarre, and it sounds, to some people who read the book, you know, it, it terrified them. But, you know, you can find, you can use the Freedom of Information Act and find the government has, has funded all sorts of unusual projects. When I give you a, a classic example, it's, it's totally different. But I recently got hold of files, official files, through the Freedom of Information Act, showing how in the 1950s the U.S. Army had actually spent thousands of dollars trying to determine if dogs possessed ESP, and if those same dogs could use ESP to locate landmines uh, on battlefields. Um, now, whether or not dogs do have ESP and can locate you know, landmines on battlefields, I don't know. 
but the mere fact that the government spent a significant amount of money and time funding it demonstrates that you know it doesn't matter how strange something is if there's a potential military or espionage or intelligence angle to it you know the government with all its funding doesn't mind you know throwing x thousand of dollars into that think tank or group to just see again you know what comes out at the end of it and if something does great and if nothing does well you know what's a twenty thousand dollars or half a million dollars even out of a couple of billion a year dollar budget you know what i mean so Absolutely, and of course, of course, uh, you know the myriad of government agencies that may be involved uh, could be quite large, and that yeah. doesn't even take into account uh, private contractors. And no, that's uh, right. Again, that's yeah. one of the big things a lot of people forget is that you know a lot of work today isn't done by the agencies themselves. It's actually done by by contractors, by you know, for example, private security companies uh, like Area Fifty One. You know, it's not people think it's patrolled and policed by the military. It isn't. It's it's by private contractors. Um, you know, where and and they they have the contract. It's not you know um, Delta Force or you know the the a particular branch of the army or the air force or the navy. You know that patrols around Area 51. It's it's private security. Nothing to do with the government. It's just government contractors. Yes, and uh, even if you look back in history, like. Uh, with uh, MK Ultra and the various offshoots of of that program or other programs similar to it, a lot of that stuff was farmed out to universities. Yeah, um, yeah I think it was um, was it Sidney Gottlieb who was working in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and yeah, people uh, like Sidney Gottlieb, you know, they were doing all sorts of. I mean, some people might call it groundbreaking, other people might call it, you know, torture. But you know, experiments to see the limits of the human mind and what could be done with it, and you know, digging into mind control, mind manipulation, but also you know, digging into ESP and extrasensory perception related issues, you know, precognition, psychic powers, things like that. Yeah, and and he did a lot of his work under the auspices of a university, so you know, yeah. that was not. Um... You know, that was not something that you could find out necessarily through Freedom of Information Act or anything. No, that's right. Uh, and of course, the more strands you have going in different areas and hidden under different groups, the more and more difficult it becomes to to solve the mystery. And I think, you know, governments realize that as well. You know, if it's all, if it's all held in one agency, it's far easier to get the truth. When the strands of it here and there... You know, it's no wonder we're all sort of left scratching our heads because it takes you in so many different directions, so. Absolutely, yes, and and um, I think uh, people would do well to realize that that um, you know, especially like looking at it from a disclosure angle, that uh, that, that uh, there are so many other entities involved that that would be free of any kind of uh, you know official government disclosure mm-hmm. about about this particular phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And yeah, um, I think also you know a lot of the times people say, well, the government says. We don't know anything about what you're asking us for, like files on Roswell. You know, I sometimes wonder if the elected government today actually doesn't know what happened at Roswell because there is a group buried so secretly, and they're the ones that are hiding the truth. You know, it's like people are very critical. A lot of people in the Roswell research field are very critical of the government, you know, tell us the truth. But my view is that, ironically, I'm kind of sympathetic to the government. I think the irony could be that they've looked for the files and they cannot find them. And they've said, well, you know, we, we can't find anything. We, maybe it was a secret balloon project, but we can't prove anything. We, we just looked and looked and looked, and we have nothing. And people in the UFO field say, oh, that's, you know, that, they're just lying. But what, mm-hmm. if, what if the government isn't lying? What if there really is a super secret, incredibly deeply buried group that isn't actually an official part of government that gets its funding outside of the government or via black budget projects? And they're the ones in the know. And even people today, 60 years after Roswell, like the CIA or the president, are scratching their heads. You know, and actually, be ironic if they're sitting in the Oval Office thinking to themselves, "I wonder what really happened at Roswell." You know, yeah, and they're yeah, exactly. As dark as we are, you know, that, that, I yes. don't think that's an impossible scenario. 
And one other one other thing related uh, to that, you know, talk about that as being a possible scenario. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, one other thing that I think is possible that 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 a lot of people don't don't really consider when it comes to things like this is is the fact that because there is so much disinformation and misinformation mm-hmm. put out there that that uh, I think that there are certain forces at work that deliberately do this to muddy the water so much that a, that a true answer can't ever be found. Um, I, I like to look at it from the, like, like the JFK assassination mm-hmm. angle is a good way to, to like present what I'm, what I'm trying to say. And that is that if you look at all the evidence that's come out and all of the, you know, testimony and everything that's come out over the years and the research that people has done, have done on the JFK assassination, you can make a case that it was like 10 or 12 different <laughs> groups of people or, yeah. and, and it would be, and it would stand up because yeah. it has mm-hmm. evidence to support it, mm-hmm. but they can't all be true. No, that's you right. Know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for that, that, you know, there's when you, when somebody goes on, on the trail of something, there's no better way to divert them than by putting 12 or 13 theories out there, you know, and, and people are just left scratching their heads as to what really happened because, you know, there's, I think they insert plausible and possibly even, even they take the risk of inserting real facts relative to these events into certain cover stories to make them more believable. But they tell just enough to get you kind of like the fish on the hook but not enough to reveal the whole story. And so, you know, somebody goes off at a tangent on this angle, somebody goes off at a tangent on that angle. And, you know, I'm willing to admit that. A lot of UFO people aren't willing to admit that. They're like, no, we know this is the correct scenario. No, we're not being deceived or lied to. You know, we know it's it's this or it's that. And I say, well, you, you don't know. You know, how the hell can you know? <laughs> if you knew, <laughs> we would be arguing about it on the radio or whatever. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and 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 you know, uh, I, I think it's it, it's uh, the greatest thing for someone to say, I don't know, uh, yeah. because a lot a lot of times people just have a particular point of view and they just want to yeah. stick with it, and it doesn't matter what you say to try to convince them otherwise, you know, or what kind of evidence you bring forward, they just have their view and that's it, and they're sticking to it. And, yeah, and I, mean, uh, I don't think these people are lying by saying they they. They, you know, they earnestly and honestly do believe. It's a genuine, honest belief system. But many people confuse a, a genuinely held belief system with having the facts. You know, it's you know, I come back to religion, which is like a very, you know, contentious area. You know, you can look at there are countless religions around the world, all having wildly different views. You know, you have Christianity, you have other religions that believe in reincarnation, which, of course, Christianity doesn't. You know, some religions, like Christianity, say that human beings are the only animals that have souls. Other religions say all creatures have souls. You know, and it's like they can't all be right, but everybody does believe that their scenario is the right one. That's why we're always fighting and whatever, you know, over religion, because, you know, it comes down to yours is wrong and mine's right. No, mine's right, yours is wrong. Well... Religion, uh, I think, you know, liking it, likening it to religion is very apt because yeah. there is a lot of dogma within the field of paranormal research, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. and that that also is true in religion as well. And mm-hmm. I think you put it very well that that these people are certainly well-meaning, and I would not, yeah. I would not say that they're they're you know going out there to deliberately you know hold the position you know in regards to whatever yeah. it is that they hold they're 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 genuine they they yeah. they they really feel for their particular mm-hmm. theory but um you know but in the grand scheme of, yeah exactly in the grand scheme mm-hmm. of things you have to say i mean is this <laughs> you know does is this really you know enough to explain what's going on I yeah. mean, uh, and, and, I, and I think to be honest, you, you really have to say no, and, and I really don't know what the answer is. And I think that's yeah. the most honest thing that you can say when it yeah. comes to the paranormal. Yeah. I think the best we can say about UFOs is there's a genuine phenomenon yes. that interacts with us, and it's real. But beyond that, you know, 64 years after Kenneth Arnold sighted in 1947, we are still grasping for the answers to what it is 
and what it wants and why it's here. Yeah, so. Yes, absolutely, and I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, uh, so let me ask you um, about uh, the NASA conspiracy mm-hmm. book. Was there a particular thing in there that really struck you, like something that came out? Because, um, like a- anything that uh, was particularly, uh, you know, um, intriguing to you, or or anything. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that sort of intrigued me more than anything else, which I've had a long interest in for, for many years, is the face on Mars. And um, one of the things, you know, I've read a lot of books about the face on Mars, but it was only sort of when I began interviewing, as I did for the book, the various researchers in the field, that I came to sort of appreciate, you know, the real, the complexities of the story and the the issues relative to the story that really, for me, do do place the face on Mars issue in the realm of you know some sort of long extinct martian species because you know a lot of people just spoke about the face on mars not necessarily realizing that there were other anomalous structures in the same area cydonia uh, of mars and even what on some of the the photographs that nasa's released looked like curious tree-like structures and bushes even and we know that mars has had in its past substantial amounts of water and 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 si- significant amount of water and its polar ice caps to this day. So I think, you know, the a lot of people have placed the face on Mars in sort of like a, a standalone category, it's just this big what looks like a carved face out in the desert, not realizing that there's a tremendous number of other anomalies that, you know, uh, suggest that this is sort of the last remnants of some ancient civilization and and for me that that was more one of the more significant things was sort of really getting to grips with this story and, and understanding the potential significance of it, not just as something that looks like a carved face, but in the bigger picture of all these other anomalies as well, that, wow, you know, we could be looking at a, a planet that had a worldwide civilization and that some you know, some huge catastrophe, whether it sort of degraded the atmosphere, you know, and the planet just descended into, ex, you know, just planet-wide extinction. I, you know, I think that's a, a deep possibility. Yes, uh, I've also explored the idea myself when it when it comes to the anomalous structures on Mars that uh, it's entirely possible that the the people on Mars were humans. Well, you know, I actually interviewed um, a friend of mine, Mac Tonis, um, about this. He wrote a book in 2004 called After the Martian Apocalypse, and Mac actually wondered if, I mean, granted it was hypothetical, but the idea that possibly on Mars. You know, we could be talking hundreds of thousands of years ago when the face was built. You know, most researchers don't think we're talking five, ten thousand years ago. But if it was built, say, hundred thousand years ago, more even, let's say that you know there was some sort of catastrophic disaster on Mars, whether like a huge meteorite strike, a comet strike, or something that just destroyed the atmosphere. And you know, the may- yes, it's possible there could still be life on Mars today plants, bushes, rudimentary animal life even. I don't actually rule that out. But let's say, you know, this whole huge planet-wide civilization, possibly even like ours, obviously couldn't survive. But, you know, if they knew the disaster was coming, as Max speculated, maybe they came here and either seeded life or found, you know, the early primitive humans and sort of upgraded them quote with us if you like if that was even possible or gene spliced who knows and that in some respects we are the martians you know (laughs) that they came here seeded life here we're going to go there to look for their civilization and find these ancient remnants not realizing that we're actually related in some respects and i do wonder if possibly government agencies suspect this or maybe i don't know if they, they know it but suspect it and it's the I think with the face on Mars, it's the potential implications for changing human history that possibly are the reasons why the, nobody really wants to talk about this. It's not just, oh, yeah, that's cool, it looks like a human face. It's, well, what if it actually can be proven to change what we think we know about our history and our place on the Earth? Yeah. And I exactly. think it's the fact that it opens so many doors that makes us certain people think, you know, we've just got to keep this under wraps or just say it's a trick of the light or whatever. Yes, uh, someone in the chat brought up five million years to Earth, the, uh, yeah. the old movie. If you remember that, yeah, I do. Uh, that's, that's a good yeah, that fits into that category quite well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, 
I, and I agree with you. Um, I think it's it, it is a very intriguing phenomenon up there, and uh, one has to wonder how a structure could change so radically, like from the from the first images that that were brought mm-hmm. back to the so-called newer ones, and have mm-hmm. to wonder, you know, the cat box image, as it's called, of the yeah. of the face now, as it's. Uh, as it's done, it's almost like someone went and just completely obliterated what yeah, was there. Uh, I have to wonder that, you know, did, was a probe yeah. sent, you know, and with a bar, you know, who knows? I mean, it sounds bizarre, and people say we're just totally paranoid, but, you know, what if a secret space probe was sent with, like, an atomic device? You know, let's just yeah, aim it at the face, and let's, let's just destroy that thing, just get it out of our hair, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> or at least or at least, you know, provide completely doctored images to say, oh, look, there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I I don't rule any of that out because mm. uh, I think we're dealing with very large issues. And I think that's that's something that, that people need to understand, that that even if the government is hiding something, you know, really mm-hmm. important and vital, they may actually believe that what they're doing is good. They, oh, they may actually, that. you know what I mean. They, they, mm-hmm. they're not. They may not be looking at it from a nefarious aspect. They may be no. saying, you know, this is really, this, this yeah. would be shattering to people. We need to mm-hmm. cover this up because it would protect people from the mm-hmm. true knowledge of what's going on. Yeah, they, they think what they're doing is for the greater good, you know. And um, my, my view is that I think if anything significant is being hidden about UFOs, and I believe it is. I think the reason behind it isn't just because, oh, yeah, UFOs exist. It has to be something that would be so life-changing and sort of paradigm-shifting at a world level. And I think that that's why the subject is hidden, that it's it's not just a fact that, oh, yeah, we've looked into the subject and we've found there's something to it, but we're not really sure what it is. To me, that's not enough to have this wall of secrecy. It has to be something that... Is so weirdly life changing. It'd be like, oh my god, you know, there's no way we can tell the people this. But to me, you know, it's like we in the Cold War. You know, everybody lived under the threat of nuclear war, but people didn't collapse and go run into mental homes or asylums or whatever. You know, they got on with their lives and hoped it didn't happen. So, you know, what could be worse than the government saying that, you know, you're going to face nuclear destruction every day? But we lived through that. So why, if even if it's bad news about UFOs, why can't we be told the truth about that? And I think, again, it's got to be so far out and weird that beyond our understanding or, you know, that, that we just, members of the public, we're sort of scratching our heads as to, you know, what that big truth is. And maybe some certain people know in government, or they at least suspect it, you know, and they've taken the decision that right or wrong from their perspective, you know, they're going to, it's just going to be shut down, say nothing. So. Yes, uh, and and I think that like when you look at when you look at UFOs and or other paranormal phenomenon, um, that uh, while I wouldn't uh, necessarily justify the secrecy, mm-hmm. you know, and I wouldn't agree with mm-hmm. them on the fact that we can't handle it, even mm-hmm. if it is really incredibly bizarre. But I, I have to acknowledge the fact that there are people there that are probably doing what they think is that honestly and actually really the best thing, yeah. um, rather than just being nefariously saying, "Well, we're just going to keep this secret because we want to have all yeah. this stuff for ourselves," you know. Yeah, I, I don't actually think they are like <laughs> Doctor Evil types. Right. Like yes. That. Yeah, I think they are like, okay, well, we know what's going on. <clears throat> for the average person handle it. Now, the average person might be able to handle it, and I think it's wrong that they've taken the decision that we probably can't handle it. You know, And I think that's a big mistake. We should be told. And if we don't handle it, well, at least we were given the chance. You know, who, who at the end of the day, why should a select small body of people be the only people in the true, you know, having the true knowledge of what's going on? You know, even if it's a tough story to f- swallow, at least give us the chance to taste it, if nothing else, you know. Mm, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and and I think that 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 sums that up very well. You know, you mentioned the the interdimensionality aspect here um, when when it comes to UFOs, and and I know that also you've done a lot of research in cryptozoology, as as I read in the UFO Mystic blog, you you went in search of the chupacabras, and and I know you've done you've done some other work with um, other cryptids. Um, 
And uh, I wanted to ask you, like, how uh, has that, like, has your research in that field, has it reinforced the idea of this uh, of this interdimensional angle? And if it and if it has, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, it actually has. I mean, cryptozoology is probably I have more of an interest in that than I do in in UFOs. Um, you know, <laughs> cryptozoology, the search for unknown animals like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness monster, the abominable snowman, the chupacabra. That's that's probably my main area of interest. And I think for several reasons. You know, one, I like the whole. I like to sort of get on the road and investigate things. And you know, Bigfoot and things like this. They're generally reported in the same places over and over again. UFOs, for the most part, are sort of random events, and we hear about sightings, you know, a couple of weeks after they occurred. And there's not much you can do beyond go out to Mr. Jones's property and have him point to the sky and say, "That's where I saw it." But you know, it's like with the chupacabra on Puerto Rico, you know it's on Puerto Rico, so you can go out there and look for it. You know, it doesn't matter when, how long after the sightings occurred, if, if they're still around, they're still around. Um, but one of the things I found is that, like UFOs, a lot of these so-called cryptids, as they're called, crypto creatures, they don't behave as you would expect normal animals, albeit unknown animals, to behave. Like, for example, with Bigfoot, you know, there are countless reports of people seeing Bigfoot, but Bigfoot never been hit by a car. The hunters never stumbled across a body in the woods. There are countless reports of people trying to shoot Bigfoot only for the bullets to have no effect. People have tried to photograph Bigfoot on occasion for the cameras to jam. There are sightings of Bigfoot in association with UFOs. There's very, very little evidence of Bigfoot's eating habits. Now, for example, um, if you take the silverback gorillas in the in the Congo, an African, an African Congo male silverback gorilla eats on average 45 pounds of food every day. If we had a whole colony of thousands of Bigfoot running around the U.S., you know, the size of these creatures, sort of seven, eight feet tall, witness estimation, these things weighing five, six hundred pounds, we would see massive evidence of their eating habits, you know, incredible evidence, but we're not seeing it. We're not seeing mm-hmm. habitation, you know, caves full of bones or, you know, deep areas of woods converted into, you know, like areas like that like the, the, the gorillas live in. So, in other words, they look like real animals, but they don't, they defy all logic when it comes to try and parallel them with recognized animals. And a lot of reports of Bigfoot blinking out in the wink of an eye, like a flash of a light, associated with UFO reports. And so, again, I think we're also looking at, and the, the very fact that, you know, we never catch them, they're so fleeting, almost phantom like. I think, again, we're looking at something that's dimensional rather than, they may be physical. But they're not physical from here. They, you know, they're dimensional in some respects. I think. Hmm. Well, you know, you 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 really you really brought up an, a really excellent point there about the the eating habits. I I never really thought about that particular angle, but uh, that is that is so true. Um, and well, I think a lot of people. Reports. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was just going to say that that I, I I hadn't thought about that before, but it's such a a, a huge thing to consider because yeah. if you if you do um, if you do have um, a, a population of these things doing what they're doing, you know, going about their life uh, as an animal or whatever it is that they are, it certainly would have an impact on the local environment in some way. You know, yeah. whatever it is they eat would be missing from there. And, well, that's right. I mean, yeah. yeah. If, you, you know, if you're talking about, you know, one Bigfoot, you know, everybody thinks about Bigfoot because of the name. It's just this one hairy guy <laughs> racing all around the U.S. or you know. <laughs> and this, yeah. But it's not. You know, if they're physical animals, you know, somebody did a study of how many animals you actually need to have a viable, healthy colony so they're not all like the equivalent of banjo playing inbreds or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yes, um, exactly. And so, but, and you need a substantial amount. And because Bigfoot's been seen all over the U.S. Now, you know, th- there's obviously would have to be thousands of them. But if you're going to have an animal that size where it's going to need 50 pounds of food a day, well, yes, you could argue that on one day, you know, Farmer Smith's newborn uh, calf disappears. You know, that'll feed Bigfoot for a day or two. But if we're talking about animals with lifespans of 30, 40, 50 years, maybe as long as us, you know, 70 or 80, then, and they're eating 50, 60 pounds of meat and vegetables per day, and there's thousands of them, 
we would just see incredible evidence of this. You know, you'd have farmers all over the U.S. saying every night, you know, their cows and pigs are vanishing by the dozen, but they're not. You know, it's just occasional reports, which it's almost like with UFOs. It's almost like an occasional a report will occur where somebody sees Bigfoot with a baby pig under its arm to reinforce the idea that they're flesh and blood animals in the same mm-hmm. way that occasionally we'll have a UFO report that seems to reinforce the extraterrestrial angle. You know, it's almost like somebody's toying with us and playing with us. Yeah, yeah, when you put it that way, it, it does it does also seem like it's a charade itself. Yeah. Um and have you found that have you found that most of the cryptids that you've looked into, like the chupacabras and and uh, Bigfoot, as you mentioned, and and any of the others that you that you've uh, uh, looked into? I know you wrote a book, Three Men in Search of Monsters, um, where you talked about the, um, cryptozoological research. Uh, have you found that the other the other creatures that you've looked into are are similar to Bigfoot in that way? That uh, that uh, they're not actually real, in the sense of like we are real in our mm. reality here. Well, you know, I mean, some of these things, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that some of these creatures are unknown animals. There's one in, for example, Sumatra, the Orang Pendek, which is <coughs> small, almost like a pygmy type, Bigfoot type creature, sort of three to four feet tall, and, and walks upright like a man and there's evidence that he could be quite intelligent. I actually do believe that some sort of unknown ape or possibly some sort of relic, very, very primitive type of man that still exists in the jungles of Sumatra. I think that's a flesh and blood animal. Um, but things like Bigfoot and werewolves, you know, we get the Chupacabra where you have these strange overtones to them. But we get a lot of a lot of people think, you know, werewolves are just things from Hollywood films, you know, I've investigated dozens of werewolf stories where people have described creatures with like a very hairy man-like body, walking upright, but with a head like a German shepherd, you know, a pointed mm-hmm. muzzle, pointed ears. Often the reports are around cemeteries or native in the U.S., Native American burial mounds or in England around ancient stone circles. Um, mm-hmm. And the people often feel weirdly without knowing each other the people often feel the witnesses that these entities are almost kind of psychically bleeding them dry of energy they feel kind of zapped as if they're almost like psychic vampires you know sort of emotionally bleeding them dry rather than literally bleeding them dry um Mm -hmm. you know and there's a lot of strange stories like that so you know i think some of these creatures are flesh and blood animals we haven't found others may be animals that science thinks have become extinct that still live, um, but some of them, you know, fall into a more of a paranormal category in the same way that I think some UFOs are genuinely unknown and others are military craft. You know, the, the answers aren't going to be found in one area. It's going to be several areas if we ever get the truth. I think. Yes. Yeah. I, th- I think that's. I think that's probably the best way to look at it. Um, yeah. Do you think like the Oran Pendek might be related to the? Uh, the sort of pygmy humans that they found on the Isle of Flores, maybe yeah, like a relic. Yeah, yeah I, it seems I like when I look at that, when I look at that, it seems like the Oran Pendek is like almost a dead ringer for for yeah. for that. Yeah, I think there's actually, it wouldn't surprise me in the next couple of years, five, ten years maybe at the most, we'll actually stumble across the evidence, you know, and it will kind of shake the scientific and zoological world, the idea that there's this creature that, well, what is it? Is it an, an ape? Is it an intelligent ape? Is it half human? You know, does it, if it's half human, is it? You know, should we give it humanitarian rights? You know, mm. as, as its own. You know, if that's its area. Who are we to encroach on it? Um, so I think you know, there's there's questions like this, and I think it's often the arrogance of science to believe that we've answered all the questions and there's nothing else to be found, and you know, and then this thing four foot tall hairy creature comes out of the woods with a spear one day, you know, and, <laughs> and um, upsets you know, with a, a whole bunch of apple even, carts. You know. <laughs> <laughs> upsets a whole bunch of apple carts there. Oh, yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, that's a, that, that, it's a very interesting uh, way of looking at it. Um, and I, 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 I'll tell you, because um, uh, we, we did mention one of your other more controversial books was uh, Body Snatchers in the Desert. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
I told you that I that 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 one of my particular theories about what might have occurred at Roswell um was was kind of like reinforced by by that book and I I really appreciated the work that you put into that oh, because yes I I thought it was an excellent book and and looking at it from different points of view uh it, it is so important to me mm-hmm. and and especially getting away from the idea of taking the dogmatic approach of what you're dealing with is a, a, an alien spacecraft that crashed and uh, someone furiously trying to cover up the evidence of it in the aftermath. And and what what I had what I had come up with is is my own working hypothesis. And like I said, I'm not going to claim credit for it because I'm sure somebody must have thought of it before I did. But I I kind of had an idea that. Uh, Maybe uh, bodies were found there, and uh, but they were humans, mm-hmm. and uh, I had thought that maybe the Japanese had actually developed a um, uh, a very sophisticated balloon, uh, something along the orders of the Fugo balloon, mm-hmm. and that uh, maybe it was manned by mm-hmm. people, technicians that were uh, monitoring a crude nuclear device. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, these bodies, uh, and when the balloon crashed, the vice didn't go off. Thankfully, uh, it was recovered. Um, probably uh, the uh, the Japanese who were manning it um, uh, may have been suffering from radiation exposure uh, mm-hmm. due to poor shielding. Because naturally, you'd want to keep the weight down on something like that. You couldn't really have a whole bunch of lead or anything to keep yeah. you away from the radioactive stuff. And uh, that what you were, what you saw was really uh, just a totally terrestrial thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it certainly would have had vast ramifications at the time if any of that came out. That the Japanese had a you know uh, even a crude nuclear device and and were capable of coming to the U.S. in some fashion. You know, whether that would have been like revenge fueled or whatever, because it did happen two years after the war was over. Um, but that that was an idea that I had. And uh, some of what you uncovered in in, um, in Body Snatchers in the Desert kind of like uh, uh, made me think that it was at least a possibility. Oh, yeah, I think we should never rule out, you know, the idea of something terrestrial but very kind of sinister that in many respects would be there'd be more reasons to hide it than there would be if it was an alien crash you know um when you get into the sort of ramifications of of what might have taken place you know that people think well roswell would only be subjected to such secrecy if it was extraterrestrial but no you know if it was some sort of dark and dubious military events or experiments then you know that might be embarrassing for certain people in the government back then, they may well have hidden it. And they may well have hidden it so deeply that today's government, you know, to an extent, may not really know what happened. They may have suspicions, but even they might be in the dark to an extent. If, let's say, you know, they destroyed all the evidence years ago to, to protect the secret. You know, if, it, if yeah. it was extraterrestrial, they're going to preserve the bodies and the craft because it would be so unique. But, you know, if it was a terrestrial thing, it's like, well, there's no real point preserving all that evidence if it's just evidence of a dark experiment you know especially like, well, if you get rid of it yeah right especially if you want to hide it uh, yeah. i mean you're you, there's nothing I mean, I mean if you're just if the idea is just to prevent the truth from coming out because it's some nefarious thing either something that the government did or experiments that they conducted or you know uh mm-hmm. the wild tale i just spun about japanese revenge on america um mm-hmm. it, it certainly uh, would be much easier just to take all of that evidence and destroy it, and thus, when people look back in the files, there's nothing there. They can't tell you what happened because they're they don't know. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, let's see. Why don't we, um, if you want to, uh, tell us uh, what you're working on right now? If you have got any projects in the works? Yeah, sure. I've got um, a book coming out. In I think but roughly around about the end of May, uh, it'll be all about the history of the Men in Black uh, puzzle. So you know, looking at the different theories of who they might be, who they, where they're from, what they want. You know, are they, as some people have suggested, secret agents of the government? Are they themselves extraterrestrial? Are they paranormal? 
You know, who are, are they time travellers? That's one of the theories that's been put forward. You know, there's all sorts of different angles on the Men in Black. So what I've tried to do with that one is, you know, address all the different theories and interview different players in the field. And that'll probably be out in about probably about four and a half months, five months, I think, something like that. No, I look forward to getting and that. And then I've got an, another book coming out, which isn't, it's not so much a new book, but what it is, there's a company in England putting out, it's sort of an anthology of various things I've written since I first got into writing as a teenager to the present day so it'd be like a lot of hard to find articles like from the 80s and 90s and they're going to put it out as like an anthology of you know things covering 20 years so. will that include your work uh with 40 in times um i'm not sure i i know that they they they're running articles from a lot of magazines i used to write for like beyond and paranormal and ufo magazine and things like that so and the English UFO magazine, I mean. Um, mm -hmm. So I know, I know they did approach various magazines, say, you know, hey, can we reproduce this or that? So there should be quite a, a wide range in there, I think. Yes, because I really appreciate your work you do with uh, 40 and Times. I catch yeah, I like some of your articles in there. Yeah, I've been a I've been a long time subscriber mm -hmm. to that magazine, and uh, mm -hmm. I have like hundreds of issues here yeah, cluttering up my house. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you're modern day 40, 40 and you have to have all this stuff, yep. uh, otherwise right. you wouldn't be able to function in society. <laughs> 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 you got to have a house full of books and papers yep. and magazines <laughs> and everything else because there's right. so much information for you to uh, to uh, to to dig through to try to come up with answers. Um, somebody in the chat wants to know what your what your theory is about the Kecksburg PA UFO crash, mm. and that's oh. where I am. I'm I'm actually in Pennsylvania, and uh, oh, you mentioned Stan Gordon earlier, and I know he's mm. like the premier guy on the Kecksburg yeah. thing. And uh, actually, I want to get him on the show sometime in the future. He's busy right now, uh, but maybe sometime in the spring I'll I'll be able to have him on the show, and he can he can go into it a little bit more. But uh, if you want to elaborate on Kecksburg and what what you think was going on there, I'd like to hear that yeah. story. Yeah, sure. I mean, Kecksburg is an interesting story because it's not that long ago. You know, it's like Roswell so long ago, there's practically no one left now. But, you know, Kecksburg was only sort of 45 years ago. So you might have somebody involved in the case who was 30. You know, they're still going to be 75. Chances are they'll probably still be around. So that's why, on the one hand, it's significant. But for those who aren't aware of the full story, it relates to an event in December 65 where something came down in the woods just outside of Kecksburg, on the fringes of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. And there have been various theories put forward. Was it a UFO? Was it a Russian space vehicle? Was it an American space vehicle? Was it something else? Who knows? But the, we, you know, there's a lot of credible testimony suggesting that the military went out there, that there was a big military cordon, that some sort of, like an Acorn-type device about the size of a Volkswagen car was recovered and transferred to some sort of military establishment. Um, various lobbying has been done against NASA, which I point out in the book, uh, to try and uncover more about the, the Kecksburg case, because there were you know, stories about NASA having some involvement and possibly files even on the story. Um, I think when you look at the witness testimony about people seeing this sort of flaming object in the sky that seemed to alter its trajectory, you know, meteorites don't do that. You know, they go in a straight line. This thing seemed to alter its flight pattern. Um, when you have stories about the military cordoning off the woods, other military people saying, you know, they helped transfer some type of object or saw it, you know, taken to a, a military establishment. And we hear of stonewalling and government files. I think there's no doubt that something came down. Now... That doesn't sit, the evidence that it was something Soviet or American doesn't seem to stand up. That leaves, you know, the other option. Was it extraterrestrial? Was this a genuine alien spacecraft crash? You know, I, I'll be, I have to be, I don't know. I think, I, but I do think we can say for certain that something came down that was of great interest to the U.S. government and that they very, very quickly put the lid on and have successfully put the lid on to where, at least to the point where we're not able to prove what happened nearly half a century later. So I think, you know, something weird happened at Kecksburg. It was of deep interest to the government, the military, and elements of the scientific intelligence world as well. Um, and they scrambled to, to hide it. And I think 
that's sort of where we're at today. You know, it was a, a significant event, but what it was, you know, um, was it a UFO? Was it military? You know, I, I, I think it could, it could go both ways. Um, but, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, other than it's a very intriguing case. Um, are you are you familiar at all with um um Farrell's work on uh, on the Nazi bell? Yeah, I've 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 looked into that. I mean again, you know, it's interesting. I've I haven't sort of done that much research into the whole German angle of UFOs and advanced technologies, primarily because a lot of other people like Farrell, you know, have done research into that area. But yes. I, again, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence to show that the Nazis were working on some really weirdly advanced technologies in the latter stages of the war, you know, and uh, had it gone on much longer, you know, they, they may well have won if they'd sort of introduced some of these technologies on a larger scale. I think, you know, there is evidence to suggest they were working on, for example, like circular shaped aircraft, yes. you know, plans to even bomb America, you know, they, they had plans on the drawing board, you know, for... Um, rockets to send atomic weapons, you know, to bomb New York. You know, mm. If the war hadn't have ended, you could easily see, say, by 1948 or whatever, you know, they may have been just flying missiles across the Atlantic and, you know, we'd all be talking German today or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, thankfully, we don't because German <laughs> is a pretty tough language. <laughs> <laughs> Although English, I'm told, for people who don't speak it natively, is rather difficult to learn. So uh, at least it follows more regular orders of grammar. Uh, yeah. But the reason I brought that up is because uh, some people have theorized that the that the Kecksburg thing was very similar to mm. the actual device of the Nazi bell. Yeah, and, no, that's a good point. I mean, there are similarities in the shape. You know, it's sort of a yeah. bell, acorn shape type. Yeah, so yeah. That is an interesting sort of parallel. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about you know to support that, but I mean. Right, the right. I, that I, it is similar. Yeah. Yeah, that, that and that's pretty much the reason why I brought it up yeah. is just because there is a similarity there. Um but uh, you haven't done much much looking into the German angle of uh, of this. No, but, no, I haven't, but chiefly only because, you know, it's like a lot of people have been researching yeah. and working in that field for years and it's like, well, why blunder in and do right. stuff that's just gonna copy what someone else has done better, you know, for years. It's right. I'd sooner focus on things where I feel that I can bring something new and not go over old ground in yeah. areas where I know more, you know, it's like that if I investigate to the German angle, not only would I have to investigate, but I'd have to do a huge amount of new research just to catch up on what other people have done for years and what they're still doing. So, you know, why not let the the good people are still doing that? Absolutely. Continue to do that and I'll you know, I'll do other stuff. So things like abductions, you know, there's plenty of good, solid people been researching abductions for years, you know. Mm -hmm. Why not let them continue and then they've got their angle, somebody else does their thing, you know, and hopefully that I think from my view that that's gives a better opportunity for us to get the answers if, you know, there are different people in different fields rather than us all running around like headless chickens investigating a bit of this or a bit of that. So. Yes, and uh, I think that's uh, it's a good way to, to approach things because uh, the the books that you you put out do kind of go down their own path rather than maybe following along the lines of people who do other research. Um, another uh, another recent book that you had out was Contactees where you... Uh, where you uh, Actually looked at the what people call the contactee movement um, from the beginning and some of the more interesting cases there. Um, maybe we could talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, sure. Well, the contactees were these a bunch of people, primarily in the late forties, early fifties onwards, and, and through to the present day, who claimed contact with allegedly very human looking aliens um, that became known as the Space Brothers. And the the story is highly controversial. In the beginning, in the early years, um, the sort of late 40s, early 50s, many of these encounters allegedly occurred out in the deserts of California, New Mexico, Arizona, places like this, um, where people would feel compelled for no real reason to go out to remote desert locations, not really knowing why, and then claim that these sort of classic 
1950s style flying saucers would come down and these human looking aliens would come out of the craft and there'd be sort of this often like a telepathic exchange on spiritual issues and the dangers of atomic bombs and things like this as if the aliens were coming down and wanting to warn us of you know our warlike ways but they weren't approaching the government they were clandestinely approaching members of the public and many of these people the so-called contactees who claim to have had these experiences began to it, it radically sort of change their lives you know they went on the lecture circuit they wrote books they set up almost like communes and uh, and groups etc and it almost became like a cult type situation you know almost like a 1950s equivalent to the whole flower power thing in the 60s you know where people set up communes and organizations with hundreds and thousands of followers etc um and the the movement is certainly not as popular today as it was back in the 50s and 60s but you know the the whole contactee movement still exists you know people who say they've met these human like aliens and um I wrote this book, Contactees, uh, a sort of really original title there, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because a lot of people had sort of delved into the stories, but not hadn't looked into the different theories, again, that existed to possibly explain what was going on. And, you know, there are different theories that the encounters could be interpreted literally. Other people thought that because some of the cases were highly controversial and almost fantastic sounding, that some of these people could be government agents trying to make the UFO subject look stupid. Other people wondered, were these people being manipulated by the government themselves as some sort of mind control thing, you know, to see how far we can manipulate people's minds. You know, if we can make them think they're seeing aliens, we can make people, enemy troops on the battlefield believe, you know, they're seeing thousands of tanks or whatever when there's, you know, just ten, you know, sort of just just playing tricks on the human mind. Mm. And you know all sorts of different theories like that. So I looked into that book at the the cases, the people, and the various theories, and you know again try to come to some sort of conclusions. And again, like the overall UFO subject, I'm not sure the contact team movement can be explained in one category. You know, I think some of the contactees were undoubtedly genuine. Some of them were con men. Others, I we can prove, did have ties to the intelligence community and could well mm. have been spreading disinformation to actually make the subject look ridiculous, you know, by claiming to have flown around Venus with with hot looking space girls and whatever. <laughs> but some of them did actually claim, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, and, and if they did, well, good luck to them, you know. But uh, <laughs> I do think some of these stories could well, where we can tie the people to having had backgrounds and links with people in the intelligence community, you have to wonder, you know, were they asked to put these stories out there? So it would make the mainstream press sort of roll their eyes and not investigate the subject. And you know, you could argue that that's exactly what's happened. So. Yeah, and I and I I, I think that uh, if nothing else, I think that uh, uh, there may be some elements w- within the government or media that actually you know mm-hmm. did use the stories to that effect. Yeah. You know, whether or not that that's what it really was. Uh, they they made it out to be that way so that it yeah. could uh, put some scorn on the entire idea and make it seem like UFOs are just a foolish thing that people uh, yeah. needn't get bothered with at all. Yeah. Were there any uh, Were there any Men in Black encounters uh, associated with the con- uh-huh. with any of the contactees? Not not so much literal Men in Black, but there are cases where, for example, we know the FBI closely watched many of the contactees because the files have now been released through the Freedom of Information Act and you know the some of the, one of the theories is that all the men in black you know they're, they're government agents and, and there are examples where for example George Van Tassel one of the early contactees he was visited on several occasions by agents of the FBI and this is now reflected in the files that the FBI has now de- officially declassified showing that they did visit him um, but as far as these sort of weirder men in black stories you know the sort of the ones Keel talks about with the glowing eyes and they'd sort of appear and vanish off doorsteps and you know you don't get reports like that in the contactees but there is evidence of government people watching them very very deeply one of the most famous contactees was a man named George Van Tassel who held yearly conferences out at a place called Giant Rock in the deserts of California in the 50s and they got hold of his FBI file which is just under 400 pages in length 
you know, and he was watched for like 15 years by the FBI just for claiming that he met aliens who wanted us to disarm our nuclear weapons. You know, so <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, they no, they didn't want to hear that. <laughs> no, that's right. Well, that's, that's one of the important things. You know, the, a lot of the reasons for the surveillance wasn't just because people were saying they met aliens. It was because you had. It was almost like some of the contactees were becoming the equivalent of like protest groups. Do you know what I mean? They were they were saying, well, the aliens said we've got to disarm our nuclear weapons. And if you've got 50,000 people buying your book and going to your lectures because the aliens want us to disarm our atomic arsenals, you're not really that different from the FBI watching just a regular person who says, you know, we disagree with us having atomic weapons. You know, I think mm-hmm. they, the contactees, many of them, were, were viewed as national security issues, yeah. not because of the UFO angle, but because of the political overtones that went along with their, with the stories they were telling. Yes, I, I, I could definitely see that being the case. Um, you know, it's very interesting to me, you know, you mentioned the fact of um, this sort of commune angle and uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's associated with the, with the contactees. And uh, that kind of, that kind of like made me think of, um, Something that uh, Jacques Vallee looked into uh, regarding, and I, forgive me, I, uh, the person's name escapes me right now, but it was a uh, uh, famous abduction case where um, a a man was was apparently taken by aliens, and after he was brought back from wherever he was taken, he he ended up forming like a a religion, mm-hmm. and the uh, the, I think it was in France that this happened, and uh, the the French authorities actually monitored the the mm-hmm. cult, if you want to call it that, for years afterwards. And um, that made me that made me think that uh, there's a strong association a lot of times with the with whatever information is coming out of of UFO encounters and religion. It was, oh, yeah. like a, it was like a yeah. strong connection between the two, whether it's forming one or whether it's just the, 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 the construction itself or the revelatory experience that, that, that people mm-hmm. have as a result. I don't know what the cause and effect is, but it does mm-hmm. seem like there, there is a connection there between the two, which, which might be an interesting thing mm-hmm. to, to investigate at some point. Oh, yeah, there are. I mean, you know, a lot of people... In the same way with religion, a lot of people who have UFO experiences, they find their lives totally transformed. And, you know, the, in, many respect, in many respects, the aliens sort of take on a, a, like a, a science UFO equivalent of, of God. You know, they, they put all their faith in the aliens. You know, the aliens are going to come down and save us rather than there's going to be some second coming or, you know, we're all going to be reincarnated. You know, it's the aliens. They're going to solve all the problems. And so you do find that, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of deep parallels. Um, and there's not that much, you know, people can argue there's that much difference between, you know, a biblical account like Moses going up the mountain and getting the Ten Commandments, which tell you a way to live, and somebody going out in the desert and having long-haired aliens, angelic-looking aliens coming down and saying, this is how you need to live. <laughs> you know, it, there's not that mm, right. much really. It's sort of very, very similar, if not identical. But again, the only difference is it's like the phenomenon has upgraded itself according to the perceptions and cultural beliefs and of, of the time, if you like. Yes. Well, there were certainly some very weird uh, um, early contactee experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I could think of uh, Villas Boas. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, he, was there... the luck- he was one of the luckier ones. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess he was. Yeah, he got to have uh, sex with a hot alien, so uh, I guess that was pretty good. Um, there was another guy who um, who was given some sort of pancakes by uh, by aliens. Uh, Joe Simonson, his name was. What was that guy's name? Joe Simonson. Uh, yes, which was just so bizarre that uh, you can't... Uh, how do you classify that? I mean... Uh, well, that's one of those weird stories that it, it's almost... You know, it's like it's it almost sounds like a, a straightforward hoax, but then it's like it's so bizarre 
why on earth would you hoax a story to say the aliens brought me pancakes? You know, what would go <laughs> no. somebody's mind to make them think that? You know, I mean, that, that just, for, you know, that just, uh, it, that just illustrates the idea that there's just, uh, you, you, there's just so much weirdness around around the whole issue, you know. Cryptozoology too. I mean, Bigfoot and, and the search for uh, for for these creatures that people see, and and as you pointed out, you know, cameras malfunctioning and and all these other things that uh, it prevent you from getting quote unquote evidence of, mm-hmm. of of what it is that you're seeing, and and, and yeah, like the like, you know, he's given pancakes by aliens and. And and why would you make up a story like that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do something, I mean, make it make it a little more believable. Yeah. Uh, One it, of the interesting it, things about that story is that when the pancakes were actually analysed by the Air Force, they were shown to contain no salt. And if you go back into fairy traditions from the 15, 1400s, one thing fairies couldn't abide was salt. <laughs> you know, so it's again you have like another parallel there. Yeah, and of course. Salt has has connections uh, uh, in the occult with um, yeah. you know uh, providing protection from yeah. Yeah. evil entities too. So yeah, it, it does it goes a little bit further mm-hmm. afield. Yeah, so that's a very interesting point. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of your other one of your other books um, on the trail of the saucer spies mm-hmm. was another another excellent book. I I, I read that a couple of years ago. Uh, about UFOs and government surveillance, mm-hmm. and um, was there a? And I know you you actually got a lot of um, uh, government files, and that's mm-hmm. that's another thing that I that I appreciate about your your work. You you do back it up with with actual information to to support your your you know. Your your working hypothesis, let's put it that way, with how you put your your information together. Um, but that was a that was a a particularly uh, good book as well. Um, I wonder if you would mind telling us um, some of the most bizarre things that you've come across in your research, because sometimes I think like the the most high weirdness cases are the ones that that maybe hold some of the some of the bigger truths about about what kind of phenomenon we're dealing with here. Um, well, well, how much time do we have left? <laughs> <laughs> we've, got about, we've got about 25 minutes. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, there's been a, I, mean, I said that jokingly because there's been a lot. I mean, so one of the weirder things that I that I do get, and I found a lot of people get, the more they get involved in this sort of stuff, is the very strange synchronicities. Um, you know, strange coincidences that seem beyond just coincidences, you know, in terms of uh, almost like you're guided to meet certain people in the field because it helps answer some of the questions you're looking for. You know, I've had a lot of experiences like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I I think a lot of the, a lot of it is just sort of, just the accumulation of evidence. It's sort of difficult to put your finger on you know, one thing more than any other, for me at least. It's it's more the the fact that you know you're getting very incredible stories, but from highly highly credible witnesses. Um, you know, for example, when I went to Puerto Rico on various occasions looking for the chupacabra, you know, to hear veterinarians and police officers sit opposite you and tell you stories about their investigations, and you know, be 100% full on believers that you know what the witnesses told them was absolutely true mm. you know you come away from the aisle and thinking well you know that, that creature or these creatures really do exist so so i think it's more rather than just sort of one story it's more the accumulation which you know becomes impressive because a lot of it parallels and correlates with what other people who don't even know each other are also saying so you know it's, that's sort of what i look for i guess hmm how about a um, how about a little preview on your on your upcoming book, the the Men in Black? Um, mm-hmm. Did you did you have a uh, did you ha- did you have a chance to uh, look at the events in uh, West Virginia? Because uh, yeah, um, obviously John Keel mentioned uh, Men in Black, and Men in Black were associated with the the uh, yeah. newspaper lady down there. 
and it appeared in various different manifestations uh, around the Mothman uh, sightings and the various other weirdness that were going on down there. Um, some of them quite bizarre, like, um, mm-hmm. you know, the men in black, uh, a man in black looking at uh, some particular object on a desk mm-hmm. or whatever, and like he'd never seen it before in his life. <laughs> You know, and uh, acting uh, totally bizarrely uh, and, and things like this. Um, well, yeah, I mean, a lot, of, and a lot of the men in black, they look weird. You know, they're described as like five foot tall, very pale and with these sort of deeply penetrating eyes. And, you know, they, they're not familiar with our customs and ways of living. And I think that's what led some people to think they're literal aliens or other people say they're paranormal entities. You know, the idea that they see appear and vanish on doorsteps and um, exhibit sort of paranormal powers or some people have got this feeling of like like a, a feeling of dread from them from that they don't really understand why. But yeah, I mean, the, the, this book, On the Trail of the Saucer Spies, which was also sort of a man in black type book yeah. because it dealt with how the government watched UFO investigations. This yeah, absolutely, one, yeah. just the new book, just follows the the weird men in black, the sort of paranormal stuff that Keel and people like Gray Barker wrote about. It doesn't go down, apart from one chapter, it doesn't go down the government angle because I'd already covered that. This is like, mm-hmm. again with the UFO subject and cryptozoology, I think the men in black fall into two different camps. We have government investigators watching the UFO community. And ironically, they actually may use the weirder Men in Black motif as a cover story to cover their activities. That's where it gets really complicated. But Mm. then there are these stranger Men in Black that don't originate with the government that do seem somehow paranormal. And so I interviewed a lot of people from the the book who knew John Keel back, you know, back then, back in the 60s. People who were friends with him and talked with him and hung out with him, you know, and... um, investigated with him and um you know that that's what i tried to do with this book was get a many in, interviews and insight from the people who were around back then and and really try and you know pull out all the data and again look at all the different theories for for who the men in black might be and what they want and you know and, and again is it one theory or is it several you know mm-hmm. um, which yeah, i don't actually rule out um but I, but I think the real men in black, you know, they're, whatever they are, they're not government agents. They're they're beyond that or, or less than that, depending on which way you want to look at it. <laughs> yes, I have to say that's true. Yeah, but uh, I'll look forward to that book when it comes out because it oh, sounds well, very interesting. Oh, well, and then I'll, I'll get the publisher to send you a review copy when it comes out. So. Oh, that would be great. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate that. Um, uh you know, talking about um, you had mentioned like synchronicities and things that that, mm-hmm. that have happened to you with the accumulation of your knowledge over time, and it's sort of like something that uh, gravitates towards you, and mm-hmm. as as information as your information increases and as you look in various different angles and various different uh, pathways that you follow to try to come to uh, some knowledge about all of these very bizarre and strange things that go on in the paranormal. Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned John Keel. And one thing mm. that I found was very interesting to me whenever I looked at uh, his work um, down in West Virginia with, with Mothman um was the the bizarre circumstances that happened to him uh yeah. like um having packages or messages mm-hmm. waiting for him at a hotel that he hadn't even decided to go to yeah. you know until the last minute and mm-hmm. and he goes there to check in just picking the place out at random and he already has a message as if somebody mm-hmm. knew he was going to go there yeah and then uh also, even with uh, Kenneth Arnold, whenever he whenever he went uh, mm-hmm. up to Washington to investigate the um, the Maury Island. Island case, yeah, he had similar experiences where um, you know he was you know he thought his room was bugged and mm-hmm. um, you know there were like uh, packages delivered and and things like this. 
mm-hmm. that there's sort of this really like bizarre angle to to this whole thing and um what what do you make of that i mean mm. Have you really well, thought about it at all? Like the like the, the the sort of weird things that that come along with with whenever people you know do investigations into this work. That does it auto oh, yeah. does that like come with the territory or what? Oh yeah, I mean there's no doubt about that. I mean you know I I could I couldn't count or tell you know the number of weird things that have happened where you almost think you're living in kind of like some weird matrix world, you know, <laughs> where, you know, it's like, are we dream- is it all somebody's, some vast computer's dream world that we're just living in? You know, that we just weird coincidences. I mean, for example, there was one time when I was writing about um, black helicopter stories and, you know, military helicopter uh, harassment of abductees. And for about three days after that, we had black double rotor helicopter, military helicopters flying over our house. A very low mm. level, like four days. You know, I've been investigating something and thought, well, how can I take this further? And then somebody just contacted me out the blue and saying, you know, I was, a, I thought you might be interested in this story. You know, I read one of your books. And it relates to one of the things I'm looking into. Or you'll just run into somebody at a conference or even in a bar or somewhere, you know, and they'll just tell you their story. And it's like, wow, well, you know, I actually was looking into that and I got reached a brick wall. And now just seems like random but you run into someone who can fill some of the gaps and I think when that keeps happening you have to realize that something's going on where reality as we perceive it to be isn't what it necessarily is and it's almost like you're being the more you dig into these things it's like the phenomenon realizes and pushes you down certain pathways to sort of enlighten your mind I think is the best way to describe it or maybe Deceive us, you know, who knows? I don't know, but it's almost like that when you look for the phenomenon, it somehow knows that you're looking, and you start to get the more, the weirder stuff you investigate, the weirder your life gets in the process, if you like. So it's kind of like uh, when when you look at it long enough, it, it sees you. Yeah, exactly. It's like it somehow detects your watching it, and then whatever its motivation is, that sort of reflects you know what what uh, what happens to you i guess i suppose well on the whole um yeah that's a that's a, it's just really weird i mean that 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 whole angle to me just um you know i i think that that, that that's a good way to put it like like whatever the phenomenon is it's, it kind of takes a hold of you and um and whatever motivation it has, it's, it, it tries to push you in some direction. On and the whole, also, sorry, it, go on. Go, no, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was just going to say, and that's why I think it's also important that you know when we investigate these things, because it is like going down a rabbit hole. It's also important to have a a good foretold in the real world and have a a life away as well. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's like um, I mean, people sometimes think you know I do this. 24/7. You know, I, I don't. You know, I, I do. I try. I like to work. A lot of authors, you know, they like to work in the early hours. You know, I like to sort of do eight to five. And then people say, "Well, you know, did you see that show on whatever channel last night on UFOs?" And I'm like, "Well, now we're watching American Idol." You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, I like to. We like to sort of do our own thing. You know, we, me and my wife, we go down to pubs. We have friends over. You know, we'll hang out and whatever. And I think that's important. That you know, there's there's something to be said about the phenomenon that it can somehow get its grips into you and it can pull people into where it doesn't just become an interest or fascination and it doesn't just become an ob- it becomes an obsession and then almost like an unhealthy obsession and i think sometimes the negative aspects of the phenomenon can then really almost like take control of people and i think that's why it's important to have a deep fascination and interest in it but also be able to step away and and have a life away from it as well i agree completely yeah i i definitely agree with that and um you know uh talking about that i think uh john keel is a very good example of that that particular thing um i think that uh 
you know, whatever it was that took an interest in him, I think, you know, he reached a point in, in his life where he decided to turn away from it yeah. to a certain extent so that, you know, it didn't keep prodding him and and, and yeah. doing whatever it was it was doing to him. Well, somebody in, in once that asked way. me, you know, you know, somebody once said to me, you know, what, as a UFO researcher, wants to sort of really do this deeply, what should we do? And I, I said, we'll get laid. You know, it's like, you know, it's, but, and they were like, what would you mean by that? I said, well, you know, you've got, you have to, if you, if you, if the phenomenon, if you get into it so deeply, you know, joking aside, there is evidence that people's lives have been sort of ripped apart because yeah. something weird gets, gets its grips into them. And, you know, Keel recognized that and people like Gray Barker recognize it and they realize yeah. that. Often the way to deal with it is, is with humor. It's like the phenomenon seems to feed almost on negative energy or emotion. And the more it can put you down that pathway of being in fear and terror of the phenomenon, it somehow manipulates people and, you know, you need to be able to step away. And um, and Keel, Keel was very good at realizing that he recognized that there was a phenomenon, but it wasn't one to be treated lightly. It was one to be treated with respect and apprehension as well as from its investigative qualities as well. Yes, and I, I, as I said, I think he illustrated very well that uh, you need to be able to step away from it. You can't be so mm -hmm. meshed in it with your life because otherwise it, it, can, it, it can literally mm -hmm. destroy you. I mean, I, I, investigate. I mean I, I don't do much, you know, into sort of like demonology and the occult, but, you know, you see people who spend their lives investigating that, you know, and they, you know, it all gets very sort of dark and bleak, even though there are, there are some overtones within the UFO phenomenon parallels, but, you know, it can get, you see lives sort of torn apart in, in fields like that very often. So. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, like, when it comes to, like, the the phenomenon that's mm -hmm. behind the phenomenon, you know whatever it is that's that's uh, producing you know um manifestations of bigfoot and and ufos and uh, let's just let's just put it in the category put it in the category of just the paranormal ones mm -hmm. because we know we know and i i agree with you completely but we're talking about ufo's we're talking about a multiplicity of things here like mm -hmm. secret government craft and maybe even aliens you know in mm -hmm. in real yeah. flesh and in flesh and blood yeah. aliens and in physical craft but let's talk just about the paranormal ones and the 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 manifestations of paranormal entities and everything have you have you come to any kind of conclusion like um one is it is it just one thing behind this? Mm. Are there are there several different possible like um mm. like competing camps say mm. like maybe one that is trying to uh, uh, uh manifesting this phenomenon in a way that's helpful or or and then there's like another group maybe or another force or whatever you want to call it that that manifests this mm this sort of thing or uses it in some fashion to to produce a negative result um yeah, have I you yeah. have you really come to any ideas about that yeah i actually have I, I think you've actually sort of hit the nail on the head i think it's like you know when people say well are, if there are aliens out there are they good or bad you know it's like asking are human beings good or bad you know it's like most people wouldn't rob a bank because they know it's not the right thing to do but, you know, it's like if somebody breaks into your house and threatens to shoot and you've got a gun and you kill them, that doesn't make you a bad person. You know, you're protecting your wife or your family or whatever, you know, and it, yeah, you might feel, oh, God, I killed a person. But that doesn't necessarily make you an evil person, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, in many respects, good and evil aren't as black and white as they seem. It's depending on the person's perspective of what they think is good or evil. Um, and I think with the whole UFO phenomenon, there's a tendency, and I don't think it's done deliberately, but there's a tendency for a lot of people to for, to want the answer to be, it's this or it's that. And I don't think it's that simple. I think there's a whole range of different things going on. And in, in terms of the what lies behind the phenomenon, 
I think we're looking at entities, whether they're interdimensional or literal extraterrestrial or some other phenomenon we don't really understand. I think they have their own agendas and and some of the phenomena seems helpful and, and guiding, you know, the, like synchronicities where we're, we're led to certain people that actually help our research. Others where there's deceit, you know, and, and, and some sort of deceptive phenomenon gets its grips into people and they're almost like dragged into this undercurrent of deception and negativity and, you know, they get sick and things go wrong and, you know, then they have to step away. You know, kind of like people talk about Ouija boards and things like that, you know, the idea that when your your great-grandmother comes through that it's not your great-grandmother, you know, that it's some sort of deceptive entity. You know, you, people look at it like that. But, so I don't think it's as black and white as the phenomenon that lies at the heart of is good or bad. It's like human beings. It's highly complex, and there could be different agendas. There could be competing entities and groups. And and maybe the human race is kind of being used in some respects. You know, some people talk that we're the equivalent of almost like cattle. Mm. Maybe we're somebody's experiment. Maybe mm. sometimes it's just let's screw with the natives and see what happens, with, you know, when we get into their minds. Um, and maybe it's just uh, sometimes a malicious hatred of us you know maybe there's something about the human race that's unique or that scares these other entities you know maybe that they're they want to control us somehow that there's something about us that's you know said is unique and different i think it could be a whole range of things some good mm. some bad and if it is that would make sense because that's how what life on earth's like you know it's not good or bad it's like shades of gray if you like hmm yes uh, it, so it would it, it would point to the fact that um, that behind the various phenomenon that we've been talking about um, is another phenomenon that's even uh, broader and, and and deeper in some ways. Well, um, yeah, I mean it's difficult to try and comprehend or understand what it is, but if it is yeah. something that quantum physics would allow for, like extra dimensions, we could be talking about entities that are physical or semi-physical that have the ability to almost kind of like, you know, tune in your car radio to, from one station to another. They can tune out from our realm of existence to another, which in a way we're not able to for the most part. Um, and maybe they can somehow, you know, control their ability to exist in this realm or that realm, and for whatever reason, sometimes they have a need to come here. You know, maybe it is like some people say, these, are, these entities may not be purely physical like us. Maybe they are like emotion sucking vampires in the same way we exist on food maybe they bleed on bleed emotion maybe that's the reason they're seen is to provoke high states of emotion in the witness which they then you know feed on that's one of the theories that's been put forward the idea that they the reason we see them why people see bigfoot is because the the high state of emotion that you know pump, the, the person pumps out all this adrenaline and high stress emotion or whatever, or high excitement emotion, the idea is that perhaps these entities are like parasitic entities that, that feed on uh, on human emotion. And and that's the whole reason why we see them. You know, it's, it's their feeding time, if you like. Hmm. Well, it's certainly, uh, it, it's certainly a lot to think about whenever you, whenever you really look at the, the various mm. phenomenon that's going on. Mm. And, um, you know, one of uh, it, it's it's one of it's really important to me to remember that anytime we look at the paranormal, we're also kind of looking in a mirror at our own lives and our own reality because mm -hmm. whatever it is, it's there, it's real in some fashion, and oh, it's yeah. and it and it's and it's natural. To its own, you know, whatever mm -hmm. dimension or realm that it yeah. comes from, it's it's a part of its own environment as well, and for times part of ours. And uh, I, I I think it's really a good way to try to understand uh, humanity and and um, 
you know, our own civilization, our own environment and everything like that, looking into the these other various phenomena too, because uh really they're they're a reflection of of, of us in some ways. Mm-hmm. I think because, as you said, there are different motivations involved. There are different people, uh, like in in the field itself, that do the investigation and research. Uh, you know, they have different agendas and different ideas and different theories and and everything like that. And you can certainly look and see, like what you know, what what's come out of contacts with with extraterrestrials or aliens or whatever they are. Um, some some of it could be perceived as good or positive. Some could be con- uh, perceived as negative. Um, but really, you know, is our morality even applicable? You yeah. know, that's a legitimate question. You know, maybe our morality doesn't really have anything to do with it. Um, you know, they may be operating outside of of any moral sense. And that kind of gets uh, that that kind of um gets me back to like um uh some of the writing of Lovecraft. I don't know whether you're yeah. familiar with Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. well, I, he's one of my favorite writers and and the mm-hmm. reason being is because yeah, I, um he he kind of encapsulated that with the idea that you know these creatures that are outside, you know, uh that 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 reside in the space between spaces. They're so alien and so different from us that our morals, our our sense of of anything, have no have no place there. So, you know, that's another angle to think about whenever mm-hmm. you're looking at the at the phenomenon that there may be something that's behind it that's just mm-hmm. totally incomprehensible to our mind. No, you make and a good point with Lovecraft. I mean, a lot of people have said, you know, did he actually, was he just a fiction writer or did he have some mm-hmm. sort of insights, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. like the stories of the old ones and Cthulhu yeah. and things like that, you know. the Exactly. We, we, we're almost like chess pawns, you know, in a bigger game that we're not seeing the bigger picture that there's, you know, something going on beyond us and invoking these things or sometimes opening portals lets them through and we get an insight, but we're still mm-hmm. not really fully clued up on what's going on so. yeah even and then you know talking about opening portals you know you have Jack Parsons conducting yeah. his Babylon working and you know him being connected with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory yeah. and you know all of these various things and and um, uh, it just there there are so many possibilities and mm-hmm. and, and the idea that, that you can just come up with one answer is is the thing that that uh is so limiting for a lot of people who do the research and um that is again one of the things that I really appreciate about your work Nick but we're almost out of time mm-hmm. so um is there anywhere other than like Amazon or regular bookstores that people can pick up your books um well th- those are the main ones like Amazon Barnes and Noble Borders places like that and and all on good online bookstores and you know regular bookshops you know, smaller ones should be able to get them as well um you know they they're all widely available and I think it's only my first couple of books that aren't in print anymore but all the rest should be and you know if the, if the bookshops don't have them they can certainly order them in stock and people can learn more about what I do at you know, you mentioned the bio earlier at ufomystic.com. dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one I write regularly for. And my my main cryptozoology blog is monsterusa. dot blogspot. dot com, and I, I try. I've got quite a few blogs on all the different things I write about, and you know, people can if they go to the profile section of that blog, they'll um, they'll find links to all the other blogs as well. So. Excellent. Very good. Well, Nick, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I had a really excellent discussion with you, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. I hope I can have you on again in the future, and uh, maybe we could talk about your new book, or we could get into Mm -hmm. some other uh, interesting things uh, that you've um, investigated over the years. Maybe we get into uh, cryptozoology a little bit more and uh, look at some of the adventures that you've had in that particular field. We we kind of uh, stuck with the UFO thing for the most part uh, in this one. But I'd like to have you on again in the future. And uh, 
Again, I want to thank you for stopping by here at the Stench of Truth on uh, Blog Talk Radio. I want to thank uh, everybody who joined in today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion from uh, Nick Redfern, a prolific author, cryptozoologist, uh, UFO researcher, and uh, all-around pretty good guy, I'd say. Uh, from all accounts, and you can find him, uh, his books at uh, all the good bookstores. Uh, um, some of the I bad have, ones, well. And some of the bad ones, <laughs> and I have links to, uh, in the in the episode page, are linked to uh, three books uh, that I just picked out um, as examples of his work. And if you click on those images, they'll take you right to the Amazon page where you can buy them, and um, also check out his blog as well, and... Um, Stay tuned here, and uh, we'll have we'll have Nick back on again in the future and talk about some more interesting things. So I'll say good night, Nick, and thank you again for coming on the show. And uh, well, I'll mm-hmm. talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Ted. I appreciate you having me on. I had a good time. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Have a great night. Bye bye. You too.